Wir haben jetzt ein Thema, das sich um den Nordirak äh, dreht. Wir haben als Referenten Enno Lenze gewinnen können. Er kommt frisch aus dem Irak, sprich aus Kurdistan. Er wird uns einiges über ISIS auch erzählen können. The next speech is going to be in English, so please listen to Enno Lenze. He's going to talk about the current situation in Kurdistan, North Iraq. Thank you. So, <clears throat> something in advance. I, uh, I finished the presentation uh, like uh, one hour ago because there were some more information. So if there are misspellings or something, just ignore it. Um, you will see that I'm, I'm not really a wizard in a presentation. So just listen to me and use your imagination. I have a few slides, a few pictures, but uh, it's more about what I'm talking about. And if there are any questions, I'm around till afternoon, so just ask me later. Uh, that won't be a problem. So uh, I'm talking about Kurdistan or the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And usually when I'm referring to Kurdistan in Germany, the people say, ah, Karl May, yes, I read the book. Um, and that's uh, basically not what uh, Kurdistan is about. So I will start with a really short introdu uh, introduction. What is it? Where is it? And uh, why don't we know about it usually? Then the situation in the last year, situation now, and situation yesterday, uh, today, and in future. Um, if you have absolutely no clue what Kurdistan is about, at the end of the presentation, there is a link to my website, and I explain it in German and English the last about 50 years, how it developed there. Just to make it really, 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 really short. <clears throat> you know, there is uh, the beautiful country of Iraq, and in the north of it, there is uh, a Kurdish region. To make a long story short, they have their own borders, they have their own parliament, their own law, their own visas, but there are still uh, a federal state of Iraq. But it's, it's something between a federal state and uh, a sovereign state, because usually, like in Germany, uh, we're now in Bavaria, we have a parliament here which has some rights, but uh, we have also some laws. Uh, but we don't have border controls, visa, own police force, oh, own police forces partly, but no army. And so you see it's, it's not the same uh, as in Germany. Very important thing about the, the army, the army of Kurdistan, the Peshmerga, are allowed to operate in whole Iraq, while the Iraqi army is not allowed to operate in Kurdistan. On the other hand, uh, my visa when I'm in Kurdistan is only valid for Kurdistan, not for Iraq and vice versa. So it's, yeah, it's a, a strange thing at the moment. Um, Kurdistan also is a, is a word which is used for several stuff. It's used for the Kurdistan region of Iraq, what I'm talking about. And it's also <clears throat> the name for the whole region uh, which spreads from uh, Turkey to Iran, Iraq, and Syria. So uh, what I'm talking about is only the region in Iraq, which is also referred as the Kurdistan region of Iraq, Kurdistan, Iraq, South Kurdistan, or several, uh, several other names. <clears throat> so just to make it really short. Um, interesting thing is, by the way, they have a parliament of 111 seats at the moment, and there are about, uh, I think at the moment, 16 parties in there. So you see it's, uh, it's not like a monarchy. They really have to fight for everything in the parliament. And they have uh, what we are talking about in Germany. They have it partly uh, uh, that they have to have a fixed amount of women in the parliament. It's one third at the moment. So <clears throat> as you can see, I'm a really great wizard in downloading Wikipedia maps and uh, painting a little bit in GIMP. Um, <laughs> The problem is there are really, really fancy good maps about it, but usually they are outdated or they have a copyright. And uh, even I tried uh, on Sunday morning, the people that just don't answer quickly. So, <clears throat> but it's okay to show you the basic things. Do you see the mouse? Perfect. So this part is uh, Syria or also referred as Rojava or uh, West Kurdistan. So this is a Kurdish part of Syria as we know it in Germany. This is a borderline. Here we have Kurdistan, Iraq. This is Turkey, just to have an orientation. So this is the area which was also the no-flight area in the Iraq war when they fought against Saddam. Here we have Erbil, which is uh, the capital of the Kurdish region. Here we have Mosul, which used to be a border city between the Kurdish and the 
uh, Iraqi part of Iraq, Iraqi part of Iraq, I don't have a better word for that. And uh, this striped area was a part of the so-called disputed areas, which was somewhere between Kurdistan and Iraq. It, most people there are Kurdish, and, uh, but it belonged to Iraq. But the constitution of Iraq said uh, that the people should uh, yeah, vote if they want to stay in Kurdistan or want to go to Iraq. That should happen years ago, and it, it never happened because uh, the government in Baghdad knew that they want to go to Kurdistan, but there is a lot of oil. So, um, simple thing. Here we have the city and the mountains of Shingal or Sinja. It's like always, we have different names and different translations for it, but that's where the Yazidic people are living. And here we have Talafar. It's a really small village, and uh, you only know it from the news because there were some heavy fightings. Just to have a relation, this area is about the size of the Saarland. Even it has a different shape, but just to have uh, an idea how big it is. Important thing here is, here we have a big lake with no bridges over it. And uh, there are only a few bridges over the river here. So basically, I will explain it later when it's important, but you can cross the river somewhere here. You can cross it at the Mosul Dam, and you can cross it in Mosul. So, and between these uh, bridges, you have to uh, travel between one and three hours by car. So it's, uh, it's not easy. Situation last year. <clears throat> in uh, about May, June, the Iraqi army fled. They just left alone Mosul and uh, quite big areas. A few thousand square miles were just left by the Iraqi army. Um, they were a bit overrun by ISIS, but uh, they also yeah, start running pretty quickly. So um, ISIS is not very powerful. It's, um, they can do a lot of terror. They have a lot of people, but they don't have good weapons. They, they know the area pretty well. The leadership of ISIS are some of uh, Saddam's old generals who know the area really well and who fought a lot of war there. Then you have like in the, in the middle management, uh, mostly uh, yeah, soldiers from Chechenia who are somehow rented. They get a few thousand dollars between two and five thousand a month and so they do the management and are like uh, the officers there. And then you have the really stupid jihadists uh, who yeah, will run to every gun and hope to get their virgins uh, in heaven or something. The stupid guys who, in German, we call them Kanonenfutter, just the guy who, yeah, the operation human shield or whatever, stupid idiots. But uh, the combination is a big problem because you have really, really smart people who know the area and who know about uh, strategics and everything in the Iraq, and they know how the Iraqi army will operate. And then you have stupid people who are willing to die. What a big problem, because usually soldiers don't want to die, and you have to take care of them. But if you can just yeah, you use them and waste them, then it's pretty easy. So this ISIS people arrived. I only talked to one guy who was in Mosul at that moment and said, OK, you have 30 minutes to leave your post, and then you will be beheaded, and we will send uh, your head to your family. Make your choice. And they didn't knew if there was only this one guy talking to them or if there are a few thousand behind the next hill because they don't have good surveillance, they don't have airplanes, they don't have working helicopters, only a few, they didn't have them there. They can't assess the satellite pictures of the area and so on, so they only know what they see. And so uh, some of the uh, very young soldiers decide just to run away, which uh, yeah, from a human point of view you can understand it, you don't want to get beheaded, but there were about 10,000 of Iraqi soldiers who just ran away, and together they could fight ISIS. No problem. I hope you can see it here. That's one of the cars they left. That's an American Humvee. It's, uh, it's in a really, really high security class. It, uh, it's even proof if you fire an, uh, an RPG on it, you can run over mines and you can shoot from inside out. So you could just drive in a bunch of ISIS people and shoot them from one meter distance with that car without getting hurt. And that's a weird thing. Why do you leave such a car there? I took the picture in uh, June in, uh, on the airfield of Kirkuk, which is uh, not used for airplanes anymore, but it's uh, pretty important uh, as a strategic position. And there were dozens of these cars, also this really, really old German motorbikes from the World War. But um, th uh, there were also body armor, uh, like really good uh, bulletproof vests, uh, 
with a class four vest, which uh, are even good if someone is shooting a shotgun on you or with an, uh, with an assault rifle or something. So they even left the body armor there. And as you can see in the front, there is this uh, Iraqi army uniform and the picture was really weird because there was this car, then there was a jacket, then the lower jacket, trousers, shoes, and like if someone is removing his clothes while running away. It was a bizarre scene because they had a lot of weapons there and I just don't get why they ran away. And uh, no one uh, really knows and I hope that we will get the details somewhere in future. This is uh, another thing why I use this picture. Often people say that you have a problem with uh, press freedom and so on in Iraq or especially in the Kurdish region. I don't know how it is in Iraq but this is uh, in the Kurdish region. This guy in the front is uh, General, General Sheikh Ali, and this is uh, one of the guys who's leading an anti-terror unit. This is his actual tactical map, and we uh, went to his office and said, okay, hi, I'm a journalist from Germany, I'm reporting about this uh, situation, and uh, what can you tell me about your people who are actually fighting? And we were like, here where the S is, and he said, yeah, well, let's go to our tactical map and I will get one of my commanders and he will tell you where they were like two hours ago and what they did. And I said, okay, but uh, we will tape it and we will use the material, is it okay? And she said, yes, of course, just tape it. Uh, do you need a translator? I said, yeah, but that's, that's your actual map, that's the real thing. That's what you're working with all day. And she said, yeah, just, just take pictures, not a big deal. And now, I mean, Peter was at the German army. I can't imagine that that happens at the German army in a war. Uh, I, it's unbelievable. Um, and that's what, uh, what happened often when I asked for this. And they explained a lot of stuff. It was really interesting because it was the first time that I was talking to soldiers who actually fought ISIS and who did it on the same day. And um, so uh, what we see here is all these pins are uh, units of yeah, different Kurdish army units. For orientation, this is Shingal. Uh, this here is Mosul. So abo above this line is a disputed area. And as you can see, there were everywhere some of the Peshmerga, but uh, yeah, these pins could be between 10 and 50 Peshmerga fighters there. So you see in a really, really big area, a few thousand square, mi a few thousand square miles, there were between five and 10,000 soldiers, that's basically nothing. And uh, you didn't have a clear front line. This whole area was filled with Peshmerga and ISIS. So you didn't have a proper front line. And sometimes there were people like in this village and in this village, but in between there is just sand. And you can claim it's my area or it's their area, but it doesn't matter because at least there, yeah, there's nothing. Maybe there's a donkey or something, but nothing that you want to cover. So um, you can't even paint a real front line, you can only pinpoint where some people are at this moment. <clears throat> this is um, how a front line looks in the ISIS war. It's also different than uh, maybe in the last wars you've seen uh, anywhere else. This, uh, yeah, this little bit of earth is the only protection against the ISIS attacks. As you can see, the people don't have any body armor. They don't have helmets, they don't have flag vests. And this was the front line. And somewhere here, uh, according to my uh, measurement uh, utility, uh, 153 meters from us, there was ISIS. So you see this guy here with flag vests and helmet. That's uh, Jan Eichelbaum. That's a, a war journalist from the Netherlands. Of course, we had our body armor with us as well. And everybody else, doesn't have anything. Now you can see the guns here. You have really nice and shiny Glocks who were, uh, which were just delivered from Austria, but that are handguns. It's like, yeah, uh, it's nothing serious in a war. But they told me, yeah, uh, we could get one of them so we can put a bullet in our head when ISIS is coming. So that's a nice offer, but not really my cup of tea. Um, <clears throat> This guy is a general, which is also really interesting because the general is at the front lines. And this is a Dragunov sniper rifle. It's from the 50s, 60s, but it's still good. If you know your business, you can shoot someone on about one kilometer or half a mile with it. 
Uh, and I think it's some kind of statement if the general doesn't have any other weapon than a sniper rifle and says, yeah, I'm doing the job on my own at the front line. It's, it's really hard there. And then, of course, you see the Kalashnikov, which everybody has there. It's, it's, a, it's a good weapon. If you know your own Kalashnikov, you can shoot a few hundred meters and really hit a body. Um, but it's just an assault rifle. It's nothing big. So you have this people there, a bit of earth, and that's a front line to ISIS. That's it. That, that's the whole thing. And uh, so uh, when ISIS arrived there with uh, the Amor cars they just got from the Iraqi army or they stole it or whatever, they had nothing to penetrate the car. And ISIS, ISIS could just come uh, pretty close and start firing with assault rifles or something. Because the Peshmerga don't want to die, they had to take cover and could do not too much. They could fire back a little bit. They could throw grenades. They have a few tanks, and that's it. But there's not much you can do. This is one of the really, 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 really rare tanks they have. So here uh, you see um, the quick response force of the Saravani Peshmerga. This is like the special forces or something. And that's important because they have helmets, but uh, the helmets are not really bulletproof. It's, uh, they protect you a little bit, and uh, by chance, they can protect you from bullets. But basically, it's, uh, yeah, it keeps your brain together when someone shots you. And uh, so you see, even, even this quick response force doesn't have flag vests, not even that. And uh, that's really, really, a really big problem. And they don't have, uh, they don't have rockets. They don't have proper grenade launchers. They don't have an air force. They don't have good surveillance. They have nothing. So <clears throat> what happened then? Last August, the situation escalated. Um, ISIS uh, went into uh, the Shingal Mountains with about six or 7,000 people. They arrived at the checkpoints of the Peshmerga and uh, did the old story. They said, you have 30 minutes to leave, and then we will behead you and send you ahead to your families, uh, make your choice. And the problem is you have a lot of Peshmerga who fought Saddam and who, who know how to act uh, in such a situation. But you also have, uh, because it's 20 years ago or even more, you have a lot of young people, 20, 30 years old, who have never seen a war and uh, who are not very experienced and had a really short training, three to six months maybe. Uh, and so they didn't know what to do and asked their commanders and the commander said, okay, how many are they? A few thousand from seven directions uh, with uh, armored cars, with rocket launchers, with everything. And they said, okay, pull back. It's, uh, it's a really bad decision to do, but um, you, you could leave your people there or your soldiers and they will die, you can be sure about that. And you know you need these people later. You, you have a long war to fight. Uh, or you can pull them back, save their lives in that moment, but you know that you will leave uh, the Hasidic uh, people there alone. And uh, it, it was a, yeah, it was a really big thing, even in the German media, but especially there, that people said the Peshmerga ran away and just left us, while Peshmerga said it was a tactical decision to pull back to uh, get more weapons and bring them back. It's, uh, yeah, it's a hard decision. I don't want to do such decisions or don't want to be the one who has to decide. <clears throat> Situation then was, there were less than 10,000 Peshmerga at 3,500 square kilometers. So you can imagine there were not a lot of people there. They don't have armored cars. Uh, it was a, a really bad situation because they knew we have to decide, uh, are a lot of people dying here or do we want to die together with them? That was the only thing. Uh, they had more people at the other side of Mosul, which is not too far away. It's, maybe 100 kilometers, it doesn't seem much, but because Mosul itself was blocked and the roads are very bad, if you're an experienced driver there and you have a, like a, a land cruiser or something, you can do the trip in six hours. But uh, if you have to get your people together and you're lose it, uh, using trucks and so on, it, it's like a day trip to get there. And um, so they couldn't bring in people pretty fast. Next thing is they don't have helicopters. You can't imagine it, but they are fighting uh, ISIS only on the ground. So 
Peshmerga pulled back, but some had a relative there and said, we will stay on our own risk. So about 1,300 300 stayed there, but not in one bunch, but spread it on like 50 or 100 kilometers. So only, only a few guys with a few Kalashnikov. Um, <clears throat> then there was a deal. Uh, we don't know 100%, but for me it seems pretty clear. Uh, that the president said, okay, uh, a really, really big thing at that moment was the independence of Kurdistan. They even uh, talked about it in the parliament and wanted to make a, uh, yeah, want to, to form an independent country at that point. It was pretty close. And then uh, there was a problem that America said, no, Iraq has to stay in one country because otherwise we failed and the US never failed. So we can't, uh, we can't help you with that. And uh, so there was uh, obviously a deal that uh, they don't talk about independence anymore, but they get airstrikes. And uh, um, the aircraft carrier Bush was already in the Gulf, so they could be there in a few hours. Um, problem with uh, aircraft carrier operations is that they are really, really, really expensive and you usually don't want to do it. The next airbase is about, uh, yeah, with a fighter jet, uh, maybe one hour from there in Turkey, but uh, Turkey doesn't give the rights to fly over Turkish uh, area to fight ISIS and Syria didn't do it as well. So they had to start uh, in the Gulf and uh, fly over Kuwait, over Iraq, to attack them. And uh, there was an urgent request for weapons. And uh, yeah, you know there are uh, websites where you can track the flight path of uh, airplanes. And if you know the, the little number of the president's airplane there, you could see that he was in France, Britain, uh, Germany, and all the people who could supply some weapons in the next days. Already uh, in June, there were German military advisors, but uh, not from the German army, but uh, people who worked in the army and uh, then just were in Kurdistan for private reasons or with private companies or something, but not with the Bundeswehr. But I talked to them and they did some proper training there. So, special case, the 74th genocide of the Yazidic Ye people um, to make it short, Yazidic people are one of the oldest uh, religion in the world, about 4,000 years old, but I only know basics about it. In the next days, when Shinga was somehow on its own, uh, thousands just get slaughtered. I don't know a better word for it because that's what happened. And it was really hot. It was between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius on the days on the mountains. And uh, they didn't have water. The, the YPG, that's uh, like Kurdish army from Syria, that's the one who fight in Kobane, that's where most of you will know it from, moved in from Syria, but it took one or two days to get there and they don't have proper weapons as well. So they moved in, um, helped the Yazidic people a lot, but they couldn't fight ISIS. They could just uh, yeah, control a bit of the damage. And the Yazidic people from two, uh, two own local forces, the YBS, which was trained by the YPG, and the H uh, HPS, which was uh, trained by the Peshmerga. And the important thing is that the Peshmerga and the YPG and like the PKK and so on, they don't like each other. It's uh, often in Germany the people say, yeah, we're delivering uh, weapons to the Kurds, but who says that the PKK isn't used it against Turkey later? It's like... Uh, in the time where we had East and West Germany, like if you say, yeah, we're delivering people to West Germany, but who say that they don't wear, want to share it with the East Germans? It's uh, the same likely. It's, uh, it will never happen. And you see now, uh, when the people in Kobane are using German weapons, it's not that the YPG is using the weapons. They sent in Peshmerga who have to use the weapons and have to bring it back. So that's a big problem because there were a lot of clashes and like a big media war because YPG said Peshmerga ran away and we liberated Shingal. And the Peshmerga said, yeah, no, we did the job and you, yeah, you only have a little bit. And a uh, big problem to say what the truth is if you were, weren't there. Then there were a lot of long fights and just uh, on really, really short distance, a few hundred meter and shooting with Kalashnikov on each other and hope to survive. So, help the Kurdish way. It's just one picture because it's, uh, from a German point of view, really interesting. You see uh, 
I didn't get a better, better picture, and thanks to Rudolf that I can use it. Rudolf is one of the Kurdish news agencies. You see a helicopter and a door gunner, and here you see that some of the used ammunition is falling down. It looks like a yeah, pretty normal Russian military helicopter. The interesting thing is it's uh, from uh, Ravanga, which is a help organization. Uh, this helicopter is flying in uh, humanitarian aid to the Shingal Mountains. And they said, well, the problem is uh, you can't discuss with ISIS uh, with a cup of tea. Could we bring in some humanitarian aid? So uh, we need weapons. <clears throat> and because uh, the Iraqi army isn't helping, and since the uh, Peshmerga don't have helicopters, they equip their own helicopters and just use old fighting helicopters with uh, door gunners and just were flying into Shingal and uh, yeah, shooting uh, into the ISIS areas to get a clear path to bring water and uh, all these things to uh, Shingal. And that's really interesting. Um, a few journalists were in the helicopter as well and they said it's a weird situation when you're delivering uh, water while people are firing on ISIS, but it's the only way they can do it. And I think if it helps, it's, it's okay. Um, but on the other side, I can't imagine like the Red Cross is flying uh, combat helicopters and shooting uh, on enemies while delivering help. It's, uh, yeah, as they told me, it's the Kurdish way to do it. They need water, we deliver. Yeah, of course, <clears throat> there are really millions of refugees. This is a picture from last week from the Domitz camp. It's one of the biggest and nicest camps. It's, uh, as you can see, they have uh, only a few tents. It's more like small booths or even little houses there. It's one of the, the best managed camps because it's pretty old. There are a lot of people from Syria. Uh, at the moment, there are about two million refugees in the Kurdish area, and they have about five million inhabitants. So in Germany, we know we can't uh, deal with more than five to 10,000 refugees because uh, the boat is full and we can't afford it in anything. Uh, and in Kurdistan, they have uh, yeah, two million. So it's like if we had in Germany like 30 million refugees here. And they can't afford it either. They have a lot of uh, problems because of that, but they say, uh, what, what can we do? We, we can't let the people die with ISIS, so we have to, have to deal with the situation, however. Um, Meanwhile, most of the people are in camps, not as nice as this, but at least they have a tent, they have water, and they have basic food and medical supplies. In June, there were a lot of people just living on the streets because there were thousands and thousands getting over the border every day, and there was just no chance um, to supply them, uh, all of them well. Situation 2015. That's the same app as before. <coughs> uh, this are the disputed areas I talked uh, about. And meanwhile, it's uh, not called the disputed areas anymore. They just call it Kurdistan because they say the situation is solved. Um, the Iraqi army left. We are there. Our flags are on the building. It's ours now. Thank you. And we won't give it back anytime. And uh, because the Iraqi army wasn't there since six or seven months, not sure if they want to get it back ever. That is, uh, that's the path we were driving with our car. Uh, or about Erbil, the hook, and that's like a safe path you can use with not too much trouble. Till the hook, it's okay, and here it gets a little bit bumpy here and then. Um, and uh, yesterday there were big fights in Talafar, but I will explain that later. Just to remind you, this is the area which is uh, which was Iraq after the German weapons arrived. Uh, it was Kurdistan. So, <clears throat> weapons and air, rain, uh, air raids. Um, the, the really simple problem was ISIS was attacking with uh, armored cars and the Peshmerga couldn't fight them in any way. So, uh, after they get the German weapons, especially the Milan rockets and uh, the Schwere Panzer Faust III uh, uh, grenade launcher, <laughs> not, not not high-tech, not the newer stuff, but uh, really good for them. And also the G36 uh, uh, assault rifle, which has just more power than a Kalashnikov. Uh, the US also supplied um, Kaliber 50 machine guns, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that they delivered uranium ammun uh, ammunition because I saw some of the radioactive symbols on uh, uh, 
yeah, on some of the supply things for the machine guns, which makes completely sense in that situation because uh, you just have to fight cars with uh, yeah, uh, armor penetrating, uh, armor piercing ammunition. So the distance, uh, the, the fighting distance got longer because the Milan can shoot a few kilometers. They were able to destroy armor uh, personnel carriers and the tanks. And that was a really, really, really important thing. There was a big fight about here at Mosul Dam. They said after they cleared the dam, um, they could move on for three or four kilometers without any ISIS. So you could cover a lot of ground in short time after having the German weapons. And then three or four weeks ago, four weeks now, they started here a very big operation and cleared this whole area, which is three and a half thousand square kilometers in 48 hours. That's uh, insane if you compare it to any other war in the last years. But it, uh, it showed the people that ISIS is not unbreakable, uh, that uh, the other thing is right, that you can fight ISIS pretty simple if you get weapons from Germany, which we don't use anymore. It's so simple. So, <clears throat> situation when I was there last week. There were German weapons, of course, a lot. And uh, some of the German media reported nobody knows where the weapons are and nobody has a clue. And I asked them why they reported it. And they respond, ah, no, 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 we, we never said that. We said that we think that the German army doesn't know it. But we, we never said anything about the German weapons in Iraq. Which is a bit odd because everybody I was talking to understood it in the way that nobody knows where the German weapons are in Iraq or in Kurdistan. <clears throat> so... Um, of course, there is a proper list of uh, where the weapons are and uh, who's using them. And, uh, well, the list was shown to me, but I wasn't allowed to look inside because it's uh, classified at the moment. And I'm still talking to the Peshmerga ministry, which part of that could be made uh, public or something like that. But they offered me to see a lot of the weapons because of some uh, clashes with the ISIS when we were approaching, we couldn't see the Milan from pretty close, but we saw a Milan rocket flying, which uh, helped us a lot because uh, we got under a uh, grenade attack by ISIS and uh, a Milan rocket, uh, let's say, solved the situation for us in a proper way. Um, <clears throat> so I can say there are Milans in the right hands and it helped me a lot. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, so then we have a lot of air force in the air. There's a so-called coalition, uh, US, UK, Belgium, Denmark, Australia. I don't know if the jets from France are already there, but as far as I know, yes. Turkey is not really um, attacking something. They are just doing surveillance flights and having an eye on it. And Iranian air force with American and Russian jets, that's a funny thing, uh, are flying in the very east, and uh, but also attacking there. and. Um, but especially US and UK, they have experienced pilots in the area and they're helping a lot. And there are ground troops from the US, UK and Iran. There are only, only really small amounts, not big troops, but they have uh, like a few specialists on the ground from the US, from the UK. As far as I think, it's special air service, but I am not very familiar with the uh, UK troops, but it, for me, it looked like them. Uh, and there are a few hundred Iranian soldiers in the east of Kurdistan in the area about Sulmania, but they are not on active duty. They are just uh, yeah, doing training, as they told me. So the lost German weapons. We asked around, have you seen any German weapons? Uh, the problem was we were in the mountains uh, with no real internet connection and nothing, and uh, with a bunch of Peshmerga guns. They said, yes, of course, uh, give me 20 minutes and I will show you. And then they showed us a G3 weapon, and he said, okay, that's a bit odd because uh, you never got them from us. Uh, <laughs> uh, as far as I know, and they said, no, it's uh, from, that were old ones, really old ones. And maybe from, uh, they, they got it from Iran or something. Uh, they also captured a lot of weapons, and they have a big mixture of different weapons. So it seems to be uh, something like a unique old weapon someone grabbed sometime. And you say, no, 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 we need the new weapons. And say, yeah, we have, we have this funny thing you see here. It's a, yeah, it's a bazooka, and uh, do you want to see the car we just smashed away with it? And uh, so we knew, okay, it's working, and they got a proper training, and they know how to handle it, because the, par the, the car was in three parts. Um, then there was this general with a G36, and both of them said, 
thank you, Merkel. It's really interesting. All of them know the name Merkel. Uh, they really know it, and they said, when you see her, tell her thank you for this great <laughs> weapons because that are the weapons who are helping us now a lot. Um, yeah, here it's just a detail because I said I want to take pictures of the detail to have the proof that it's German, and it is. Um, this is one of the Yazidic fighters. Uh, this, this is a holy temple, uh, Sherfadin. This is the holiest place of the Yazidic people, and he has a yeah, brand new G36. And uh, they have a lot of, uh, more of them, like a few dozen. So um, since the aim of my trip intentionally, intentionally wasn't seeing the German weapons, that's why uh, we were not, uh, yeah, we didn't thought about that before. It happened just uh, when we arrived there. And so we only have a few pics of it, but um, at least we saw it in different parts of the country and it were the new ones. We got the serial numbers and everything. It's really from the batch they got uh, short time ago. Then <clears throat> this is uh, how the former disputed areas look like now. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a really, really bad war zone. A lot of the houses were destroyed just in the wars with ISIS uh, about three weeks ago, but also a lot of the homes were booby-trapped when they left, and when the first people arrived, uh, they yeah, just explode. Um, then uh, a lot of people are there told us that uh, a lot of the houses which were booby-trapped were used by Arabic people before, and they think that they worked together with ISIS before, but that's something I couldn't prove, it's just what they told us. But we've seen a lot of really damaged villages, and you're traveling like one or two hours just through this uh, yeah, former war zone with nobody living there anymore. It's really, uh, really like after apocalypse or something, and there are a lot of uh, holes in the street uh, streets where uh, grenades uh, just uh, exploded. Yeah, that's how the Yazidic people, or a lot of them, are living right now. That on the top of the Mount Shingal. Um, really, 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 really poor people. Um, usually, the Yazidic people do no harm to anybody. They just live there. They're doing their own stuff. They don't want money from anybody. They don't harm anybody. You just could just go around them and nothing will happen. So that's, uh, that's a really bad thing. Now they even left their houses living in the tents. They are not, not winterproof. They don't have proper clothing. They don't have light. In this village they told me, yeah, they have uh, like three tents and a donkey and that's it. And uh, they uh, get some rice, they get some water, and from time to time they get something to cook a soup, but that's it and nothing else. And uh, so you see there's a lot of help needed. And uh, this man was uh, the one who talked to us all the time. And he also said, okay, when you get back, get an appointment with uh, Ms. Merkel and tell her I need to help. And uh, that's what we are trying to do right now. So this was a situation on the Shingal Mountains. This is the city of Shingal. So this is south of, uh, of the mountains. And at that moment, uh, our security team said, okay, they had information that it's safe to go to Shingal right now, uh, to the city of Shingal, just down the mountain, and uh, then uh, we can see the Milans and talk to the uh, artillery general who will show us a lot of stuff. And when we were about, I think, somewhere here, our brakes were running too hot and they were smoking because um, when you're driving down the mountain, there are 144 curves you have to take, and because everybody can see you there, the driver was uh, speeding up and braking and speeding up and braking to not giving a too good target. And when we stopped here, it was really, really handy because the grenades were flying here. Um, <coughs> and um, that was a pretty bad situation because we were in a convoy of about five cars. Uh, we had a lot of protection there, but uh, only uh, three RPGs, and uh, they were ready to shoot. And in that moment, an, a Milan, or I guess a Milan, because it's not flying in a straight way, Milans are wobbling a bit, and uh, the guy who was shooting it, you clearly could see that it was not just a pipe, but there was like a square on it, and that's, uh, it could be other weapons, but, I, but since they don't have anything else but a Milan there, I'm pretty sure it was a Milan, it helped us. Then we had get back there, 
and uh, took some pictures and yeah, they said Shingal Mountain is safe, but as you can see, uh, not sure if you can see it here, that used to be a building which uh, yeah, was just bombed away in that moment. Uh, Shingal City isn't safe, or at least not last week. So, situations in the last day. Um, the ISIS supply lines from Syria to Mosul were cut two days ago. And the U.S. Uh, is using some different planes now while they used the FA-18 before and make uh, like the usual attacks you know from the TV, a jet is flying pretty high and somewhere on the ground something is exploding. They are now using the A-10 Warthogs. They are 40, 50 year old jets. Really simple, but really good if you uh, want to have eyes on ground and shoot something there. So they were built to destroy tanks and really to uh, yeah, to assist people on the ground from a very, very short distance. And uh, I saw videos this morning where you could even see the A-10 flying over the people in, I guess, one kilometer of high or something. They have uh, a very specific sound of the board gun, so you even uh, know that it was a warthog even if you didn't see it. And uh, they helped a lot cutting the supply lines, and then the Peshmerga were able to put their tanks on the supply lines and a lot of military there. and. Yeah, we will see if it will work. And it's unclear how much ammunition uh, ISIS has in Mosul, but I guess in one or two weeks we, we will know about it. So they have the all tanks they use now. They have the Milan to protect the area. But what about Mosul? Mosul is a special case. It's uh, surrounded by Kurdish uh, populated areas, but in uh, Mosul itself, most of the people are Arabic. And they don't want to be part of Kurdistan, and Kurdistan don't want to have Mosul is an Arabic city, but it's basically, it's okay. Everybody's fine with the situation. But now you have the situation, you have ISIS in the city, and you don't want to have the city. So what do you do? You can, uh, you can attack Mosul, lose a lot of your soldiers, and have a city you don't want to have. That makes no sense. On the other hand, you can't let ISIS stay there and wait. So cutting the supply lines seems to be a good way. And uh, then we will see if ISIS will leave Mosul. I think we will have uh, some uh, bombs in Mosul in the next days because that's what ISIS is doing when they don't have anything else to do. They just bomb and make terror and you stay behind snipers and stuff like that. But hopefully uh, it will end then. And then, by the way, I didn't talk a lot about the Iraqi army. That would be a perfect task for the Iraqi army to do, just recover Mosul because they want to have the city. Problem is, a few weeks ago, an, uh, very high official from the Iraqi army said, okay, yeah, they had a small problem with their army, but he thinks they will have a working army again in two to three years. <laughs> so, maybe they can talk to ISIS to make a short break for two to three years until they are ready again. Otherwise, Peshmerga have to do a job they really don't want to do, and the people in Mosul don't want them to do it. So it's a messed up situation, but yeah, can't do anything. So, thanks. Ah, this is the last uh, nice picture we took there. This is, uh, this is Shingal Mountain. This is the city of Shingal. This is a uh, FDP or German liberals politician, uh, Tobias Huch, which, uh, who, I, uh, yeah, who was with me there all the time. And uh, yeah, we took a picture with the Peshmerga fighters and Yazidic fighters with, I'm not sure if you can read it, with Je suis Chali and the Kurdish flag, and that's, yeah, more or less in the middle of the war zone where they are really fighting ISIS. And uh, they just wanna show the people um, that they support the Jesuit uh, Charlie as well. And uh, of course, nobody there like the jihadists who are bombing uh, Europe here. So if you have any questions now, just ask. And otherwise, uh, follow my perfectly made blog and on Lensity, uh, ask me something at Twitter or whatever you wanna do. Can you say something about the root causes of IS versus Kurds, uh, terrorism versus state, civilians, uh, and what lessons should Germany, the EU, learn from this? And uh, maybe you can say something about the uh, financing of IS. There were the rumors that uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar mm -hmm. 
are financing IS or have financed IS or that it got out of control and so on. And, but I'm especially interested in root causes and what we can learn. And I think the, the core problem is people want to get, get rich fast and easy. Um, because you see the people who are running ISIS are not in a war zone or anything, but they make a lot of money and they are in some safe, safe positions. Um, yeah, what the really root of ISIS is is unclear, but one of the German uh, trainers uh, from a private military company in Kurdistan told me that uh, two years ago he was asked uh, by uh, Academy, which was Blackwater or XI, the, the private army from the US, uh, if you want to train some militias in Jordania, um, <clears throat> and the profile was pretty much what ISIS is doing right now, uh, but he said no thanks um, because, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it was about uh, moral or money, but at least he didn't do it. Um, but he said his idea was that uh, they were forming or tried to form some, uh, yeah, some small army to do whatever in Iran, uh, Iran, and it failed, whatever. But that's only one, one part of the story, but he said it really seems to be the same profile like what ISIS is doing right now. On the other hand, of course, uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia is financing a lot of stuff, and I, I think it could be that they, they financed it. And then you have the old Saddam guys who had nothing to do and uh, yeah, hate just everybody and want to make money. And I think somehow maybe some of these people met and formed it and make the plan like, okay, let's make money fast. Um, we will run over the Iraqi army, we will uh, grab the uh, oil fields, we will sell the crude oil on the black market and uh, yeah, take some hostages and get some money. And uh, you see it when they covered Mosul uh, over half a year ago. Um, they didn't kill too much people, they killed everybody who was in range, but they didn't try to kill everybody, they killed everybody on the path to the banks and then they moved back a lot of the stuff and they got cash money, they got uh, gold and uh, diamonds and stuff like that, and they got um, stocks on paper, as they told me. I had, didn't knew that there are still stocks on paper, but uh, you can trade them like money. And uh, shortly after that, at some big financial point in the Mideast, there was a lot of stock, stock trading. It was like a really big peak, just for one day. And it seems that uh, they found some banker, even we know the moral of bankers are really high, who were willing to uh, trade the stocks for some money. And uh, so they got about 500 to 900 million dollars just from that. And that's, uh, yeah, a lot of money. And uh, <clears throat> so I think the root cause is greed. And uh, to find stupid people who think that uh, jihad is a good thing and to make the combination of you know what to do, you have, uh, yeah, like some, uh, let's say, startup money from maybe Saudi Arabia or somewhat. And uh, you have uh, people you can rent in Chechnya to, yeah, to don't do the dirty things on your own and to stay safe. And I think it's really just about power and money and not about cheats and. Uh, uh, Sunnis and all this stuff. I think it's just power, money, and try to run over the country and uh, install a new government and got the oil or something like that because they are very, very focused at the beginning on Baghdad till uh, the Americans and the Iraqi army make like a belt around Baghdad. But that's just my idea. I, I'm not sure if it's uh, the right conclusion. When you told us about the situation where some single troops are there and others there and you don't really have a front line, yeah. um, it obviously was the same situation on the other side. The ISIS troops didn't have a front line as yeah. well. So um, when I heard the very first reports about ISIS troops some time ago, I had the impression that it's really some kind of large army. I don't have this impression now anymore. So what is your statement as someone who was there? Do you have the impression that it's a large army but only some of them were there because they also cover a large area or do, do you think we overestimate them? Um, <clears throat> that, that's a really, really big point nobody knows. Um, I heard estimations about 10,000 to 100,000 people in the ISIS but really nobody knows. I talked to uh, an American military advisor from the uh, 
Department of Defense and I talked to uh, people from Israel who are usually well informed and uh, I talked to uh, German Bundeswehr and so on, so people who are should know about it, and all of them said we don't know if it's 10, 20, 50, 100,000. It's really strange. So uh, I think they have a lot of people, um, and they have a lot of supporters also, so people who, who are not really fighting with them but uh, don't want to do any harm to them and hope to benefit from it. And uh, so I think they, they have people, but they don't have well-trained people, and that's a good thing. And at the moment, I guess, what I've seen that there are about 30 to 50,000 maybe, but it's a really, really rough guess. But for me, the important thing is they only have a few people who really know what they are doing and they have a lot of people who are just running around and shooting. So it's, uh, even if they have a lot of people, it's an easy target. Uh, to your knowledge, what is the nearest position of the ISIS to Baghdad? Um, yes. Just wait. Ah, okay, I don't have Baghdad on my map. Um, <clears throat> as, as far as I know, uh, at the weekend, they were about 20 kilometers of the border of Baghdad in the northwest. Um, and also, they're coming from the north, but there it's 30 kilometers, which is not much as well. And they already have the people inside Baghdad who are doing uh, bomb stuff. So it's, it's really, really close. And uh, most of the Iraqi army is just in the belt around Baghdad. That is why they can hold it. But uh, when ISIS gets one pass into Baghdad, I think they are done. It's, it's really close now. Thank you. My question is, Enor, first, you, you are doing a great job. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> and to give us the impression. <laughs> You might know that I was also deeply involved uh, to the Kurds after the yeah. Chemical Weapons attack in Latra. I was working there with the uh, NGOs. And my question is, because in history, Kurds were all times misused by power states, uh, US, uh, Iran, mm -hmm. Turkey, and so on. You know that very well. Yeah. And in this uh, difficult situation, uh, we've had a also in my uh, parliament in the northern part of Germany, a discussion and resolution about if it is the right way to send weapons uh, to the Peshmerga. And in history, I was fighting with them, with the Kalashnikov 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, now I decided that I'm strongly against it because I'm afraid about what happens in the near future. They will once again, uh, countries or soldiers and the Americans will um, handle with them like, like with a hot potato. So um, there will be a change again. Uh, you are in favor to send weapons uh, to them, of yes. course. Uh, and I think this is uh, the issue we should discuss, not now, but maybe mm -hmm. in our working groups because our basic position as pirates is not in favor yeah. to export weapons and so on to a critical situation. Yes. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think it's a really, really bad point. So <clears throat> let's say usually, of course, nobody likes war, uh, me neither. I think the problem is you have to fight ISIS in some way. And uh, like if you let the Americans do the job once again, they will have a lot of influence, even the the parliament or the, the government of the Kurdish part, they want to stay independent. They don't like the influence of other people, but what can they do? And so I think when Germany is sending weapons now, at least in the last decades, we didn't try to invade any other countries or do any too bad stuff. And so if we send the weapons, uh, we can provide something and we know that the German public would never allow to do more than sending weapons. And then we can help them, helping themselves, and to uh, get the influ influence of the Americans, uh, yeah, keep it smaller at least. Even we don't have a proper air force who could assist. But I think we only have the chance someone has to send troops there, or we have to assist them, helping themselves with weapons. But uh, you can't fight ISIS without having a war. That, that's a big thing. You can try cutting off the, the money, but of course that never worked in the world because someone is profiting. And so I think I, I don't, basically I don't like the idea of sending weapons there, but I think it's, uh, it makes the smallest damage when Germany is sending weapons and we have 
a slightly control over what's happening there because we didn't send too much like of the Milan launchers and now we can control it with sending the rockets a little bit and we know we can deliver a few rockets and wait and deliver rockets. I think it's, uh, it's not a perfect solution but it's better than letting like America or Russia getting even more influence in, uh, in that area. So, I am, yeah, it's, <laughs> however you turn it, it's, it's never a good choice. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I recently talked to a former consultant of the Iranian Sec uh, uh, Secretary of State, yeah. and um, he told me about that uh, Iran, lost, uh, Iran lost, lost to five generals in the war against ISIS in the last uh, month, and um, he told me even that Iran will never accept uh, the reign of ISIS over great uh, territories in Iraq. Um, because Iran thinks that uh, Iraq is their, um, their um, area of interest mm -hmm. and um, that they will, um, then when, when ISIS will, will, um, will um, claim more territories from Iraq, then Iran will um, invade that territory to, to free it. And um, what do you think to that situation? Do you think that when uh, Iran will get more into that war against ISIS that the area will be destabilized in, in a, great, a more greater um, amount? Yes, uh, because when Iran is really sending, uh, as I told you, there are a few hundred Iranian soldiers there and that's accepted by all sides because they are not fighting too much and that's uh, like a small side story. But I think if they really want to invade bigger parts, on one hand, the Kurdish regional government is not too close friends with the Iranians, to <laughs> say it in a friendly way, and they don't want to have too much influence there. On the other hand, obviously, the Americans don't want to have the influence in uh, their claimed country. I think it's like uh, when everybody was uh, spreading in the US and claimed their own country, and like now America is in Iraq and says, yeah, it's ours, we will set up a McDonald's here. And then Iran is coming and saying, no, no. And uh, I think if Iran is really sending a lot of ground troops without talking to all the others, then we will have a really, really messed up situation because then we will have uh, Russia and Iran uh, against uh, America and uh, yeah, America with Iraq and the Kurds and something and then, then you will have a really, really, really big mess. And I don't think that anybody will profit from that because then... Hmm? Yeah, yes, it can happen, of course. Yes, uh, especially, um, yes, uh, Angelica told before, she has lots of more experience in that area than me. She was there for, let's say, decades and, uh, yeah, like lived there for a long time. Uh, she knows everything. She knows the language. I don't know it too bad, uh, too, too good. I only know two words. So, um, yeah, I think it can happen and if the situation is not stabilizing very soon it will happen but then the whole thing will explode oh. yeah i think uh, we can't speak in that case uh, over countries we have to speak over ethnic groups and religions means uh, one reason for the success of isis is the failure of the shiite uh, run government in the Iraq, that is one of the points the court said, yes, okay, we make our own thing because they fail yeah. in, in the state thing. So you have um, Shia Muslim against Sunni Muslim. And uh, ISIS is, uh, for every ISIS fighter, a uh, Shia Muslim is a heretic who has to be to killed. Means, you have, uh, of course, then Iran said, okay, we will um, provide... Um, aid to uh, the Shia Muslim, and that is what at the moment is happening. The Iranian army is training the Shia militia in south and in Baghdad to fight back uh, the Sunni extremists. And you get a religion war uh, in that area, not uh, countries in that case. Yep. Um, in addition in addition to the question we just heard before here uh, about the scenario with Iran invading Iraq, i just wondering um, if, if we had the scenario that uh, ISIS was actually uh, capturing Baghdad and therefore Iraq pretty much um, 
totally falling into uh, become a failed state and not really having a government anymore. If we just um, implied for a second that there were uh, the US keeping out of that and just uh, measuring up the military capacities of ISIS and mm -hmm. Iran, how likely would it be for Iran to pretty much capture the whole of the right now ISIS-controlled Iraqi territory? And I mean, could they technically just um, completely conquer Iraq just by military means of ISIS? Mm -hmm. Um, it depends on how much of the Iraqi equipment ISIS has. I think <clears throat> if the Kurds would just hold their positions and uh, the Iraqi army just run away, uh, the Iraqi army just run away like always, and the Iranians would just fight ISIS. And ISIS does not have all the weapons of the Iraqi army right now. Yeah, next Sunday uh, we will have a big Iranian state there, no problem, because ISIS isn't that powerful. They only have a lot of people, but if you have uh, fighter jets and big bombs, you can bomb away a few hundred with one hit, and then it gets fewer and fewer and fewer uh, pretty fast. But if ISIS is capturing uh, especially the last existing uh, helicopters of the uh, Iraqi government and uh, the fighter planes they just got from Iran and all these things, and they know how to operate them, but I think for money you can buy pilots, it's not a problem. Um, then, uh, yeah, then it depends on who, who has the better tactics. So it, that's why we have to stop them now when they are weak and can't wait. But uh, at the moment there are uh, at least 1,000 American troops in Baghdad and 1,600 Peshmerga and uh, also the Iraqi army. But I think even because Baghdad let in 1,600 Peshmerga to uh, protect their, um, their capital showed that they are so weak, they, they really fear that Baghdad will fall soon. And uh, I have no clue where they moved all their military, military equipment because they're using nearly nothing of it right now. If they want to spare it for the big fight, or if they sold it earlier to someone who sold it to ISIS maybe, or whatever, um, we don't know. Uh, but so I think at the moment uh, Iran could cover ground, and uh, but uh, if ISIS gets all the weapons and is really using them, then we have a big problem. Um, I, my question is: uh, Wouldn't it, it be a good idea for the future if Germany, the German state, uh, doesn't allow um, the U.S. Uh, army mm -hmm. to use Germany as a logistical platform mm -hmm. because I think the, the cause that we have this almost failed or failed state is the, the war began by the US and I think they are using UK, Germany, Italy and so on as logistical platforms and uh, I see an, a conflict with uh, the, the Grundgesetz. Mm -hmm. The Constitution. Yes, um, yeah, I think that's a really, really, really big problem for me. On one hand, of course, I don't want to have Germany as a logistic point for any other army for several reasons. Uh, not only the Americans, for, for nobody, because I think army is just made for war, and in cases of war, you don't want to have any other army in your own territory. Simple thing. The problem in this special case is that the Americans are helping a lot, and that's a, yeah, a big moral problem for me that the guys who are usually for me the bad guys with the NSA and with uh, the drone wars uh, operated in Germany and all this stuff are actually the ones who are helping there to fight ISIS. And so at the moment I think um, supporting as whoever is killing ISIS is doing the right job at the moment. But uh, on the long term of course I don't want to have uh, any other army operating in Germany uh, and especially not in a way the Americans doing it where we don't have any control over it or even more, we know what happened and say, no, nah, I haven't seen anything, I think everything is fine. It's just bullshit because nobody's taking German government serious on the rest of the world when we're doing this or when they say, yeah, I don't think they wiretapped my mobile phone just because they told me. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's somehow funny, but it's so sad. And so, yeah, I would agree that it's not a good idea to uh, use Germany as a, uh, yeah, as a big point for other armies. Uh, is there a perspective for a uh, Kurdish state, do you think? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Well, there are two things uh, which are important. One thing is if they can, uh, yeah, if they are strong against Baghdad, and at the moment they are because Baghdad is nearly not existing in a governmental way. 
uh, they covered a lot of ground. They can protect their own area. Important thing is they have their own money. They have uh, good connections to Turkey and to Iran. That, well, let's say that the connection, especially to Turkey, is uh, is a big thing. But they have a good economic connection, which is a base for a good connection, usually usually in the world. Um, and so, from that point of view, they can do it. But of course, the Americans are the important ones uh, in that question, and they said no because uh, then we failed. And I think in the moment Obama says, do it, uh, then they will have a sovereign country. It's, uh, so from my point of view, it's only America which has to say yes at the moment. What about the Kurds from Turkey? Do they play a role in this uh, whole set of um, just, just a short answer. Here's the uh, Kurds from Turkey play a role here. Not really. The, the YPG in Rojava in Syria are like a, a sister organization of the PKK, so they play a big role there. But in, uh, in uh, the Kurdish area in Iraq, they, they have a minor role that in some areas they fought in some cities uh, in the last time. But at the current situation, they don't have a big role there. And in the future, they don't, don't, uh, will have a big role especially because they don't like each other and they want to have them out again. Um, what is your opinion about the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, now in, in retrospective? Uh, Which one? Uh, in, 2000, <laughs> in, in 2003, I, I think ah, one, okay. sees, one, th one sees clearly that uh, the Kurds are the clear uh, winners of the oh. um, Iraq war. And uh, do you think that it's just... Uh, that it was just uh, accelerating uh, developments that would have uh, happened anyway um, uh, by uh, the, the Arab Spring, like they, they happened in uh, Syria and uh, Libya? Um, or do you still see it as a disaster? Uh, yeah, both. Um, let's say, uh, I think the problem is that the story doesn't start in 2003, but yeah, centuries ago, basically. And uh, it's always a problem for me to say uh, which, uh, which reaction is basing on which event in the past. But let's say in th uh, 2003, the Kurds have a really big advantage after that because they had the no-flight area, they kicked out Saddam, they kicked out all the private military companies from uh, the Kurdish region. Uh, no private military companies allowed to operate in uh, Kurdistan, not even if they have diplomat status in Iraq. That's also a very, very special case. Um, so um, let's say from the Kurdish point of view it was good and I think for a lot of people in Iraq it was really good at the beginning because Saddam was away and there was the short time where it seemed that it could get better but then they failed to, uh, yeah, to unite the country and uh, to let everybody participate because I think in all the countries where Kurds are living uh, yeah, they don't have uh, the right they need and um, they only want to have a sovereign state because they can't participate. Like uh, the people from Bavaria don't want to have an own state in Germany because they have the same rights like the people from, um, from Hamburg, from Berlin or whatever. Why should you have your own state? But in the moment, everybody is punishing you all the time. You want to have more rights than your own state. So in 2003, you could say, say forget everything that happens. Let's try to do it. Uh, and let's unite the country. Everybody has the same rights. And we will make like the Kurdish area we will make a Shia area, a Sunni area, and like federal states or whatever, and everything is specialized in your culture, and let's do it, something like that. But then you need a president who, who is willing to do it. You need a lot of people who are doing it. You need to do a lot of promotion uh, and tell the people that that is the way you could do it. Problem is, uh, like always, uh, revenge and greed and all that stuff. And I think that's the big problem because, well, the invasion itself, uh, Hard to say. It could help. It failed. Yeah. Uh, from now, it's it's easy to say it. Uh, it wasn't the right decision, but it's uh, it's more complicated, I think. But uh, the real the real fail was afterward that they don't uh, they don't support the people to build a, a good government, which everybody accepts. But uh, then just the position changed. Uh, Sunni and uh, Shia just changed roles. Kurds did their own stuff like always, and it didn't didn't really help. And uh, so I think the failure was later. And now we are at a point where they can't do it anymore. Uh, I don't see that you can unite the people in this moment. It, uh, it's not possible.
I want to do an announcement. Also, the American way of nation building does fail every time. Afghanistan, Kurdistan, Kosovo, it's uh, always the same shit. But um, in, the, in the court question, um, in the Iraq, the Kurds have de facto an own state. Yes. It, it is so, and so they, they could live with it very well. They had the problem that uh, both the PKK, the Turkish Kurds, and also the Iraqi Kurds tried to have influence on the Syrian Kurds because that are the, the third party in that. And but um, the, the only or which country you have to then to hold in your eyes is Turkey because they want to get a major power to 2023 means the old Osmanian uh, Empire. And uh, for me, it's very strange. There was no necessity for ISIS to attack Kobane. That makes co military completely no sense. If you have other battlefields in Syria, you have to, to uh, win first. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the, you have really hold a sharp eye on the Turkai because they are very strange acting at the moment. And uh, to be honest, uh, the, the Turkish president uh, seems to be a little bit ill for me in the head and uh, yeah, maybe become very interesting. Yeah. But I think that the main player in that game is Turkey. And uh, just to add something to Turkey, uh, we all know the documents which were just released and seem to be valid. But the really weird thing is uh, when in June the Peshmerga uh, were in danger to run out of money, Turkey supplied ammunition and weapons to the Peshmerga. And that makes no sense for me at all, supplying ISIS and Kurds. But doesn't make the story easier. Thank you, Anna. It's quarter to one. If there are any requests to speak, just do it now. Or we'll take a break for about five minutes. Continue at 12.50 with uh, Peter Finkelgrün. He's going to talk about um, the conflict dynamics in the Middle East. So, um, are there any requests? I don't see any. So, thank you very much, Eno, for your magnificent speech. Thank you.